So good morning. So in this session of Applied Mathematical Finance, we will continue discussing calibration of our big term structure model. So we started a section on the calibration of our discrete forward rate term structure model. Uh, well, you could ask, okay, what is calibration about? Yeah, it's how do we determine the free parameters? So talking about the free parameters, these were the initial condition, the volatility parameter and the correlation parameter. So the covariance structure of the model. We already had a session on the choice of numerea which then determines the drift, which also has an impact on the results well, in terms of a numerical error. And um, we discussed how we determine the volatility function by first looking at how does the model reproduce caplet prices. So calibration, is how do we determine the parameter is how do we reproduce prices of observed market instruments, observed quantities? How do we uh, set the model such that it reproduces our observation? But to some extent in the last session, we also played a little bit around with understanding how do model choices, for example, the displacement, or um, in, in the limit case, if we choose a normal or log normal model. So model choices, how do model choices impact the valuation of financial product? And the reason why that is important for the calibration is that you need to have a good intuition for how the parameters act in order to implement an efficient calibration algorithm because calibration is just the inversion of the valuation algorithm. Yeah. Valuation algorithm is you start with parameters and you get as an output the value. And now we invert this. So we have given values and we like to find the parameters. But if you do this with a numerical algorithm and we will later see some numerical algorithm, for example, the Levenbeck Marquardt optimizer, you have to transform this problem in a way that, for example, the numerical optimizer is not captured in a local extreme or in a local minimum. So, and for this, it's maybe good to, to understand how do the parameter act and what are the right quantities to look at. And that was uh, the thing that we saw at the end of the last session, for example, if we talk about valuation, it's sometimes better to look at implied volatility, which is just a conversion of the price into a different quantity, instead of looking at the price directly, because the implied volatility is much more sensitive to a certain change in the model. Okay, so that was a nice takeaway, and maybe that is a summary to the last session. Uh, why calibration yeah, is also about understanding how the parameters act. So we started the session on how do we choose the volatilities. And for example, for the special case of a log normal model, we saw that there is a constraint. They the integrated variance, so more or less the integral here of this coefficient squared over time should equal some quantity related to the caplet value, well, the square of the implied black volatility multiplied with the maturity. So we got a constraint. If that is fulfilled, the model is calibrated to caplets. So now go, let's go to uh, another financial product that is sensitive to the volatility parameter, uh, swaptions. So how do, we how do we calibrate swaptions? Or how, how are swaptions now depending on our model parameters? <laughs> 
So let's recall uh, the definition of a swap option. So first we had a swap option is an option on a swap. So you see in our definition, it's the maximum of the value of the swap at a certain time. So that's here the exercise date when we exercise the option. And inside this maximum function here, we have the value of a swap. So what was a swap? How does a swap depend on our model primitives? So a swap is an exchange of payments of fixed and floating rate. So that was here our definition of the swap. And you see the swap pays here the forward rate minus a constant times the period length multiplied with maybe a notional, a sequence of forward rates at different times. And here these times were the payment times. So you see that the swap references multiple of our forward rates. And these then occur here inside the value of the swap option. But this here is the definition of the payments of a swap. So this is that a swap pays these amounts. And in the definition of the swap chain, we are referencing the value of the swap. So that's a subtle but important difference. We have here the valuation of the swap at a specific time. So let's have a look back how we valued a swap. Okay, so we could very easily derive here this theorem. Surprisingly, the value of the swap is just given by taking the sum over the payment times here with the payment times, then resulting in this zero copper bond. And the payments reference here the forward rate at the valuation time. So this little t here is the valuation time. So if you go back to the definition of the swap chain, we see that inside this maximum function of the swap chain, we have this object here, but the little t is replaced with the t1, yeah, the exercise time of the swap chain. Okay, so you see, you have here this guy. So what do we have inside? So we have inside here a sum over the forward rates, the forward rates from TI to TI plus one, and they are all fixed at the beginning. So this is the T1. They have a common, common fixing, so all have the same fixing. Okay, so minus S, the swap rate, times the period length. Then multiplied with the zero copper bond that corresponds to the payment time, Ti plus one. But the zero copper bond that corresponds to the payment time is also fixed at the valuation time. So there's also a T1 here, and you have that inside this guy here, there's also some forward rate, let's call it TJ to TJ plus one, observed in T1. Okay, so now understanding the swap chain. The swap chain is a nonlinear function of all my forward rates, well, not all, it's the forward rates in within a certain interval. So this runs maybe from i equals one to n minus one, yeah. So just say tn is now the end of the swap. 
or maybe I choose a different letter. Let's use B minus one. Okay, so TB is the end of the swap. So it's a function of a set of our model quantities of our set of forward rates. All the forward rates are fixed, so referenced at a common time. So we see that the swap chain has a quite maybe complicated dependency now on multiple objects. And we would expect that now the sigma i for all these forward rates enters into this swap chain, but maybe also the correlation between the guys. Yeah, So there's a lot of stuff entering uh, into this financial product. So if you like to do the inversion, yeah, it's maybe not so easy. I would like to start the discussion of this option by assuming that the correlation matrix is given and fixed. Yeah? The option also has a dependency on the correlation and we will see that later. But it's interesting to first discuss the dependency on the volatilities. Yeah, So we are still here in the section on the volatility. So let's assume that the correlation matrix is given and fixed. And we just ask ourselves, so now how uh, is the swap chain price, yeah, depending on our volatility functions, T maps to sigma i. So I consider here swap chains. So we have a certain tenor structure. So I consider only the swap chains that are in accordance with the tenor time discretization of my model. So my model tenor time discretization was denoted by the letter capital T. So I'm consider here the swap chains on the swap rates that have these tenor times. So this here is the swap rate of a swap that starts in TI, ends in TT and is observed. So if it is a swap chain, we exercise in TI. So from what I just discussed, we see that this object depends on the behavior of the forward rates. Our model describes the behavior of the forward rates. So and this guy depends on the behavior of the forward rates. Well, which forward rates? All the forward rates that enter into this financial product, these are the forward rates from I, so Li, the first period, to the last period, so that's Lj minus one, the forward rate from Tj minus one to Tj. And since the swap is fixing, the observation time is here Ti, since the swap chain is fixing the value of the swap at the beginning in TI, it only sees the behavior of these forward rates for little t, smaller or equal TI. So we only observe these guys at this time. So we have the following nice little figure. So here we have our swap. The swap runs from Ti to Tj. And the swap is paying the forward rates that are within these regions. So we are paying here these guys. They constitute the value of the swap. And we observe this value of the swap at time ti, so the beginning of the swap. Well, in my definition, it was called t1, but now uh, I would like to consider swaps with different starting points. Yeah? So starting point is in ti, end point is in tj. Yeah? 
So these objects here that we are referencing, they are stochastic processes. So they move up and down and they move up and down for a certain time, namely for the time from zero, our starting point to the end time, to the fixing time. So what is determining the movement of this forward rate during that time? Well, the movement of the forward rate is determined by the parameter sigma. So all these forward rates here, they have a parameter sigma k of t. So now k is between i and j, well, j not included yeah, because the last forward rate is here, lj minus one. And t is in between zero and ti. So we understand that the swaption depends on a whole set of our volatility parameters. And given that our volatility parameters are functions of time, it depends on a certain time span, how this volatility evolves over a certain time span. So for example, if we go back to the caplet, the value of the caplet also depended on how the function behaves over a certain time interval, namely from zero to the fixing of the rate that is referenced in the caplet. So it was uh, similar, but here there is um, a subtle dis difference. Actually a swap that pays only a single forward rate. So a swap that would end here, this guy is just the caplet because it references this forward rate and it depends on how sigma behaves from zero to ti. But now the swap, if the swap becomes longer, depends also on the other guys. And the other guys, they have here a gap in the sigma dependency. Yeah? So this part of the sigma function of these forward rates does not influence the swap. And that's now um, a nice observation because now we can maybe create a really nice relation between swap values, swaption values, and the different parts of the volatility function. So in order to do this, let's introduce a small you know, simplification. We discretize the volatility function in accordance to our tenor structure. So that means we introduce a piecewise constant. Yeah, so we could introduce a piecewise constant function, sigma k of t, where the function is constant on intervals from tl to tl plus one. So this is here my sigma k of l, and this is a piecewise constant uh, representation of my volatility function. That really resembles a little bit what is happening to the caplet. So the caplet doesn't care how the function looks in between the interval. It just cares about how the integral of sigma squared over this time looks like. And we have the same stuff here for the swaption, but it's only that he doesn't care for what's happening inside a time discretization interval. But now I have a very large set of parameters. Yeah? So you see that speaking of overfitting, yeah, this is a large number of parameters that we have. And indeed we can now uh, establish a one-to-one -one relation between these parameters and the large set of swaptions, because we also have a large set of swaption. The swaption can have some starting point and it can have some um, end point. Huh? So we also have a matrix of swaption of swaptions. Okay, so let's try to elaborate the connection or the dependency of 
disruption value on these parameters sigma kl, so the piecewise constant parts now of my volatility function. So let's have on the left-hand side our input data. So we observe the swaptions. And let's have on the right-hand side, our model parameters. Sigma KL. K is the parameter that belongs to the forward rate. And L is the parameter over which time we observe the volatility of the forward rate. So L is the parameter that we observe this forward rate in the interval from TL to TL plus one. So this parameter sigma KL determines the volatility, determines the dynamic of this forward rate in this interval. I draw here on the vertical axis, the indices K, K equals one, K equals two, K equals three, K equals four. Yeah? So K equals one is the forward rate L1 that references the period from T1 to T2, and that forward rate has a volatility function that runs between T0 and T1. So here is L equals zero, L equals one, L equals two. And we see that um, the three parameters are, for example, here, this parameter sigma um, one, over the interval from T0 to T1, but then this parameter is already fixed. Yeah, so this forward rate doesn't exist after the time T1. So the forward rate is fixed. Well, the forward rate L2, that references the interval from T2 to T3, has a certain dynamic up to time T2. So in this forward rate, actually we have a volatility from the interval T0 to T1, L0, and we have a volatility from T1 to T2, L1. And then this forward rate is fixed. Okay, so we are having these model parameters in our model and we like, would like to determine these model parameters. So we see, you see there is a triangular matrix in our model. If we specify this model in this piecewise constant form, a triangular matrix of degrees of freedom. And I would like to determine now these places here. Okay, so let's start with uh, K1, L is zero. Yeah, this is similar to to a caplet, the swap that depends on this volatility is the swap that is referencing L1, which is fixed in T1. That we are looking at the swaption on the swap rate that starts in TI and ends in TJ and is fixed in TI. Then I have here the starting point of the swap, I equals one, I equals two, I equals three, I equals four. And the columns are the endpoints of the swap. So a swap that starts in one, well, the earliest points where it is reasonably ending is then in two. So let's start here in two. This is j equals two, j equals three, j equals four, 
So these are the endpoints of the swap. And we see that this swap chain here, this swap chain here is the option on the forward rate that starts in T1 and ends in T2 observed in or fixed in T1. So that's just the caplet. And this swap depends here on this parameter. No? It depends on the volatility, the forward rate T1 to T2 has in the time from T0 to T1. So I can just determine this quantity here from observing this swap, because this swap is just a special case of the, of the caplet. So now let's make the swap a little bit longer. So this swap here is the swap that starts in T1, ends in T3. So inside we have two forward rates, the one from T1 to T2, the one from T2 to T3, and then it ends. So inside I have these two forward rates and the volatility of these two forward rates is running from zero to the starting point. So from zero to T1. So this guy depends on LT1, T2 fixed in T1 and LT2, T3 fixed in T1. So it's the volatility sigma where well, k is the rate, so sigma one, L is the time where I observe it, sigma one, zero. And this is sigma two, k is the interest rate, sigma two, and it's observed from T0 to T1, so it's sigma two, zero. So this guy depends on two such volatilities. However, uh, due to this calibration, I have already determined here this guy. Okay, so maybe I make this a bit more visible. I have determined already this guy. So by looking at this swap chain here and taking the previous information, I can now calibrate this guy here which is my sigma two zero. Okay, so now I make the swap again a little bit longer. So I go here and make the swap a little bit longer and now the swap ends here. So in the swap enters three forward rates. Already uh, all the forward rates have volatilities from zero to uh, T1. So it depends on three different parameters, sigma, namely on uh, sigma one, zero, sigma two, zero, and sigma three, zero. But the other ones have already determined. So I have that if I observe this swap chain here, I can determine this quantity. So and now you see how that runs on. Because if you have completed now the columns of all parameter sigmas determined from the rows of all these swap chains, then you can move on to the next swap chain, the swap chain that starts in ti equals, uh, that starts in ti equals t2. Okay, a swap chain that starts in t2 ending into two is not a financial product. So actually you see that this financial product here does not exist. Okay, so does not exist. So the next swap chain we observed is the one that starts in T2 and ends in T3. So this one, reference is a single forward rate, the forward rate from T2 to T3. So this object here depends on L T2 to T3. And it's depending on this L of little t, well, over the time up to the starting point, the starting point is T2. So now over a longer interval, 
If this here is maybe T1, then we move now with our starting point one line further and we gain then here a, a larger region where the forward rate is allowed to move. So we are looking at the forward rate from T2 to T3 and it is allowed to depend on the volatility from T0, T2, T1 and from T1 to T2. So this guy will depend. Let's complete the writing here. It is observed in little t and the little t runs now between t0 and t2. So this guy depends. It references the rate L2. So it depends on something in this line. So it depends on these two volatility quantities. It is the volatility of the rate L2 for the time from T0 to T1 and T1 to T2. But the volatility slice, the time slice from T0 to T1 has already been determined in our previous step. So we see that we can calibrate now just this parameter here to observing this swaption. Okay, and now this game runs on. Yeah, so let me draw here another one. The observing, observing this swaption here will give me, well, it references uh, L2, so from T2 to T3, and L3 from T3 to T4. Yeah? With um, the volatilities from zero to one and one to, to uh, four. So it will actually reference this whole block here, this larger swaption. Yeah? And it allows me then to calculate that guy. Okay, and that moves on so I can, I have this guy here and I have this guy determining this guy and so on. So you can see that you get a lower triangle matrix of volatilities from an upper triangle matrix of swaptions. And there's a nice one-to-one -one relation between these parameters. So going back, assuming that our correlation is fixed, we can now determine all volatility parameters given that we define the volatility as a piecewise constant function. But speaking of calibration, we do not observe uh, what's happening in between. So maybe that's okay. So we can now imply all these sigma parameters from all these functions. Okay, so uh, as a summary, we have now the following algorithm an iterative calculation of all the sigma k l's. So you saw that we started on the outside with the starting point of the swaption, and then we made the swaption longer and longer because the starting point is also determining up to which time we observe the volatility. So we have the starting point of the swaption here, the i, which is also determining the time up to which we observe the volatility. So it's then here the second parameter of my volatility coefficient that is determining the time interval. So this here is associated with the little t. As a swap that has more and more interest rates. So that determines then the forward rates that are referenced by the swap. So the endpoint is associated with which sigma parameter of which forward rate is affected by this swap change. So going in these steps, outside loop, the starting point, inside the loop, 
the endpoint, we can iteratively determine all the parameters sigma by looking at the swaption price from TI to TJ fixed in TI and using the already determined sigma KLs where K and L yeah, are this remainder part of this box or well, of the format rates that enter into this, this swap. So we just have to invert now uh, the mapping. How does the swap chain depend on this single parameter? And here you could just use a one dimensional root finder to always change the parameter in your model. Well, if you like to do it brute force, you create a Monte Carlo simulation, you value the swap chain, you compare the value to the market price, and then you optimize this single parameter. Well, this calibration is really time consuming. So if you go back to this picture, you have here in this calibration, a huge matrix of parameters. And for each parameter here, you perform an optimization on the value. So you would perform a Monte Carlo simulation, create a new model, value the swap chain, and you would determine one after the other. So that's a really time consuming thing if you would do it like that. And since the Monte Carlo simulation takes maybe a little bit of time, yeah, even if it's just a few seconds, that could be whatever, 40 times 20 seconds. So thus there is some interest in analytic formulas. Yeah? So can we, can we express the dependency of the single swap chain on this parameter by an analytic formula so that we can avoid this numerical valuation step and we can really calibrate the parameters much faster. And we have this in um, a later uh, session where we derive an approximate analytic formula which allows a very fast calibration. So this uh, procedure that I have to have describes is also sometimes called bootstrapping yeah, because it is one after the other um, calculation of the parameter reusing the first uh, result. So here it's called uh, volatility bootstrapping. Uh, we are bootstrapping the volatilities from the swap chain market prices. Again, the remark to overfitting. So now I have a huge set of parameters. Uh, if you have uh, 20 years semi-annual model, you have 40 uh, forward rates. Well, I observe these 40 forward rates now over several time intervals. Yeah? So I have 40 time intervals, but since the forward rate is a triangle matrix, it's 40 times 20. So it's some 800 parameters. So I would have 800 parameters. I could in theory calibrate to 800 swaptions, but there are not so many uh, swaptions. Yeah? The swaptions become a little bit more rare if they have uh, larger maturities. Yeah? So the time discretization is not semi-annual, maybe it's 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, something like that. Um, so there is the risk uh, that we are performing some overfitting. So even if we have a one-to-one -one relation, now our model is very sensitive to errors in the market data. So an error in the data would immediately be calibrated into our uh, function sigma ij. Um, so that's a little bit uh, dangerous. So sometimes you combine this method with some smoothing. So you do a piecewise constant function, but you have some constraint that nearby values are not allowed to differ too much. Yeah, you can um, apply some constraint and then the calibration becomes a little bit more uh, complicated. Another 
approach to uh, avoid this overfitting is prescribing um, a functional form. So we go away from this very nice representation of the one-to-one -one relation and we, pre uh, we prescribe a functional form for the sigma parameter. For example, a very popular functional form is this four parameter functional form. The sigma i of t is a plus b times ti minus t, so some linear function, well, multiplied with some exponential decay. So this function, if you like to plot it, if you like to have a little bit intuition, looks like that. Well, you see it is reversed in the parametrization that we are parametrizing here in time to maturity. So it's a time homogeneous model. So you have some maturity TI here, and then you parametrize it a little bit backward. So I have a linear function. So there is some linear, sometimes increasing stuff here. So that's this part here. And then I have some exponential decay applied to this. So maybe it then goes like, uh, like, like that. I have some exponential decay, but it decays up to a certain level, say D. Uh, so there's a certain constant level D here. Uh, so I have some kind of hump hump shaped uh, volatility function. And that's a popular function, which is a little bit motivated from observation that sometimes volatility looks like that. So if you are far away from the maturity, so if you are here, volatility is in a certain region and then it becomes a little bit higher, but shortly before the fixing, it's going down again. If you have this functional form, you cannot do this bootstrapping, but you will still um, profit from this analytic formula. So if we would have an analytic formula that allows to calculate the value of the swaption analytically from say, for example, these parameters here, then we could combine the two approaches. We create the functional form. From the functional form, we create the piecewise constant discretization. And then we use that in our analytic formula. And then we just repeat this step and try to find the best fitting for parameters. So these are now my decrease of freedom in the volatility function to match the uh, prices. So I have uh, a combination maybe of the uh, two things with this analytic formula. And this is uh, really something which is often done in practice. Yeah, so that you have this functional form to make the model a bit more robust, smooth, that has few parameters. You like to optimize these parameters. You discretize your functional form to obtain maybe a very fast analytic formula. Okay, so that was um, a session on volatility calibration. The discussion of this analytic formula will be in a, another session and we can move to the correlations. Okay, so let's discuss now how we choose the correlation matrix. Well, the discussion is not so much about how we choose it. We, you could observe some financial products that depend on the correlation and the swaption also depends on the correlation. So if you reduce, for example, the number of parameters uh, in the volatility, then if you observe more swaption products, you could also then calibrate the correlation to these uh, swaptions. You could also think of financial products, which maybe are like a caplet. So paying an option on the forward rate 
Li, but where maybe the strike is referencing another format rate, Li plus one. Yeah? So that guy would, for example, be sensitive to a correlation of the two forward rates. But I do not want to talk about so much about which financial product do we link to the correlations. Actually, uh, I would first like to talk about how actually do we choose the correlation matrix? Do we have a functional form? Uh, do we have many factors? So does the correlation matrix have a high rank? something like that. So getting some, getting some intuition for what is the correlation doing in our model. So in our model, well, the original specification here, that was this number 100, every forward rate had its own Brownian driver, its own Brownian increments here, and we assume that there is a certain correlation between these guys. So the model is driven by an n-dimensional Brownian motion, W0 to Wn minus one. Well, it's actually n minus one dimensional, yeah, because the first forward rate is already fixed and there is no Brownian motion dW0. So we have a high dimensional Brown in motion, this vector. Our correlation matrix is the instantaneous correlations of the DWI, DWJ. Uh, and maybe you remember that we already looked at how can we represent maybe DW in terms of independent Brownian motions. You want to say, for example, U M, M could be smaller than N. Given a certain set um, of factors. So actually we just assumed that when we were talking about the efficient calculation of the drift, because this alternative representation of the Brownian increment then allowed us to have um, a much faster algorithm for calculating the drift. So we had this section on the efficient implementation of the drift. And in this section, we looked at if we represent the Brownian increment as a sum of independent Brownian increments with some factors f i k, then the correlation matrix is nothing else as f times f transposed. So, in other way, uh, uh, in other words, the f is the Cholesky decomposition of the correlation matrix. And in this representation, it's maybe much nicer to write down the drift, or we could write down a much faster algorithm for the drift. So now the remark that we can determine the factors F from the correlation matrix. So given the correlation matrix R, how can we determine the factor matrix F and N times N matrix such that the correlation R is F, F transposed? That can be done by a principal component analysis or an eigenvalue decomposition. Okay, so we can look at this. That's one part. So now when we talked about the volatility, I talked about the functional forms. And of course, you could also think about representing your correlation matrix by a functional form. So just a one parameter functional form. And instead of asking yourself, how should you choose all the 800 uh, or 400 correlations, you can ask yourself, 
how do you choose this single parameter? And a popular functional form is, for example, here, this exponential decay. So we have an exponential decay, well, in the distance of the two forward rate. So this here is the distance of the forward rates on the interest rate curve. And this function, exponential minus alpha times the distance, well, if the distance is zero, so ti equals tj, so it's the same forward rate, then of course I have a one. And then I have some exponential decay of the correlation. So it looks like that. So it means that forward rates that are close together Maybe the neighboring, they have a high correlation. So if they move like that, yeah. So if one moves up, the other one moves up too, but they could have small independent movements and forward rates that, that are further apart. Yeah, they are maybe more independent. Yeah, so they could move up and down more independently, which makes sense. Yeah, okay. So if we view this uh, maybe like, like um, an elastic uh, 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 string, yeah. So, so we have some more independent movements um, of forward rates that are further apart. So that's a nice model within a model. So you, so you see we had a model framework and now we are modeling the covariance structures by these uh, functional forms. So we have an idea of how we can specify um, the correlation matrix. And we have this aspect here that we can derive from a given correlation matrix, these factors Fi that make up the correlation matrix. And we had this section on the efficient calculation of the drift. And in this section, point was that it's efficient because we only need to work order n times m instead of order n squared. So I would like to make the n small. I would like to make the m small. So now I can ask myself if I represent the correlation matrix in terms of these factors, can I actually add a step that ensures that this M here, you know, the M is the number of independent Brownian motions I need. Can I add a step that ensures that this M is small? So I would like to have a reduced set of factors. So, so maybe you remember that M is the rank of the matrix R. So I like to make the rank of the matrix um, small. So this is called factor reduction, where we like to have, say, a small number um, of factors. So for example, often five factors are already uh, sufficient in describing the uh, correlation matrix. So from this functional form, it's not obvious that the matrix has a small rank and usually it does not have a small rank, but can we derive a procedure that reduces the rank of the matrix? And as a last step, if we have done that, yeah, we have a model within the model, a model for the correlation matrix and where we can then imply or determine the parameter of the correlation matrix of this correlation model from the observed uh, market prices. Okay, so that was, uh, that were a few remarks on the correlation. So we uh, considered volatility and correlation uh, separately. Well, that's not necessary. Of course, you can fuse the two things together and then just look at the covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix, sigma i, sigma j, rho ij. And um, then 
try to calibrate this covariance matrix. For example, if the covariance matrix is described with a functional form, for example, a functional form for the volatility and a functional form for the correlation, then you can calibrate these parameters all together to market observed products like swaptions that truly depend on volatility and uh, correlation. So you can have some joint representation. So here, for example, if you have a parameterized functional form for volatility and correlation, then you have a model within the model and this model within the model has now five degrees of freedom, five parameters that determine the covariance structure. Okay, so um, next I would like to go back to this motivating thing that I would like to have a correlation matrix with a small rank. So I would like to find a small rank matrix R. So a reduced set of factors that make up the Brownian motion, TW. So this is called factor decomposition and factor reduction. And I believe, well, maybe time is up, yeah? I cannot um, give this in this, uh, in the remaining time, but uh, let's study this in the next session because I have a nice little tool that allows us to play a little bit with these correlations and correlation factors. So if you like to peek into this already, there is here in the repository FinMath experiments, a section on factor reduction where you can run this tool. And you will see a correlation matrix here on top before the reduction and a correlation matrix here on the bottom after the, the reduction. And on the right hand side, you see the corresponding factor, okay? The two are not the same, but they are maybe similar. And you can play here with our one parameter uh, correlation model to create different correlation models. So let's study this in a very small session, then maybe in the next session. That was it for today.